Okay. Um, so the topic is bring your product manager to the open source dance. And, and the reason we came up with this topic is because uh, often open source seems like its own little club. And, uh, you know, there's a special open source group in the company that kind of works with open source foundations and projects, etc. And the rest of the company often is not involved. If there's an open source topic, they go to the OSPO or they go to the open source strategy office and they take care of things. And, and our thesis here in this talk is to say it's not enough for just the OSPO to be involved in open source. I think the entire company, uh, especially business owners of open source based products or who take dependencies on open source, and product managers in particular uh, need to be involved in open source and understand the business implications of open source and the decisions that they're making, whether it's consumption or contribution or the investment that they have to make in open source. Open source needs to be a strategic and a business decision, not just an open source decision made by the OSPO. And frankly, success is when the whole organization understands how to work with open source and it's a default and part of how the company functions. Um, so that's, that's our aim is to get there. And on the panel are four of my esteemed colleagues here. I'll just leave this uh, slide up uh, during the talk and then I'm gonna go sit here and ask away, ask a lot of good questions. And we'll, so we have about uh, 40 minutes for the panel um, and I'll do about 30 minutes, yeah, roughly, of questions and answers. And then um, we'll throw it to you all uh, to ask questions as well. Because I, I'm sure you, you all have a lot of good questions to ask. So with that, um, let me start by asking each of my panelists to please introduce themselves, starting with John Mark and uh, going this way. Is this on? Cool, thank you. Hi, I'm John Mark Walker. I run the Open Source Program Office for Fannie Mae. And I was just doing the math very quickly before this started. I've been doing open source jobs for 25 years. Um, if, if my open source career were a person, it would have graduated from college and had a master's degree by now, which anyway, that's a, yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm old. Um, but the other thing is that when I started this work in 1999, um, it would not have been possible to assemble a panel of open source experts that had three women and a dude. And I just want to acknowledge that, like, we've come along. We have a lot of ways to go, but we've come a long way. And I want to acknowledge that before we go any further. Um, this topic is near and dear to my heart, the um, bring your product manager open source, because for the past five to ten years, my career has been consumed with the question of why don't we see more business focused people in open source spaces. And I think this really gets to the centrality of that issue. And I hope that we can uh, come to some better understanding uh, at a, as a result. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikita. So I am uh, one of the Kubernetes maintainers. I'm also on the technical oversight committee of the CNCF, where I'm involved in setting the defining the technical vision of the CNCF and, uh, itself, and then figuring out which projects should be part of the foundation and so on. Uh, I'm also one of the chairs for KubeCoin. Uh, at my day job, I am an open source technical lead for a product that relates to everything Kubernetes and cloud native technologies. Uh, and I was also involved in building an open source team at VMware. Uh, so as a part of my role, I work with product managers and business side of things, defining the strategy and the engage engagement, uh, community engagement that we want to have uh, for open source. Uh, and I'm very, like this topic is very, very dear to my heart because this is literally what I do at my day job. So looking forward to talk to you all about it more. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks, Anisia, for make me here. <laughs> yes, uh, my name is Mary Wang, and uh, I'm a director of open source ecosystem for Volvo Cars. Uh, I'm based in Sweden, uh, the headquarters of Volvo Car. So I have been driving Offspawn uh, for more than one year now. We have formed the Offspawn last year, the beginning of last year. <clears throat> it's a long story. So I would like to share with you about our Osborne journey and how we engage PM product managers into this open source party. 
uh, from this open source consumption contribution and collaboration aspects. Uh, and by the way, I drive a Volvo car, uh, which is uh, not because I'm an employee of Volvo car, but it's because of safety. Um, safety is always our core concern. Um, if you know, remember that open source is not new for Volvo cars. I think our first open source collaboration project happens in happened in 1959, which we have invented the three uh, point safety belt, which we make it patent free and be used for all of our competitors in the world. So I, we think nothing is more, more important than our lives. So not cho we choose not to make it as a profit product, but make it as open source. Even though it's not software, but it's um, open source con um, conception. <coughs> Thank you. I love that story about uh, the seat belts and making it open source and available to everybody because Gosh, if you have something valuable like that, make it you know open and make it available to everyone. You'll also notice that we have two folks who kind of work in a more consumer enterprise type of company, Volvo and Fannie Mae, and then VMware and myself, we work more in a systems type of company, though Amazon has two aspects to it. Uh, one is, I, so I'm Nathia Ruff, I work for Amazon, I run the Amazon OSPO, and one aspect of the OSPO is uh, our stores and devices team, which is much more like an enterprise. And then the other aspect is the uh, AWS side, which is much more developer-centric and is a systems and technology provider. So we, we kind of uh, are spanning uh, both sides of the coin here. Um, question to each of you. How do you work today with the business side of the house? How do you interface with your product managers, the general managers of services? And do you have to pull them to the dance or do they uh, willingly come? All right, all right. twist my arm. Um, so in a, in a inter large enterprise, like, like and, and I'm gonna speak from kind of like my my history, because there's at many company. I've been at many companies, and it's kind of always the same kind of dance you have to do. Uh, but largely speaking, when your customers are developers, there's generally a pull, but it has to be done in relationship to those who own kind of like the risks and business side of the house. And in their worlds, number one, they don't really care how the stuff gets done; they just want it to be done, and so they leave that to the engineering side of the house. And so, not really thinking about the peculiarities of engaging in open source spaces. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges is like, how do you convey what happens in spaces like this? And, in, and especially, how do you put it in terms that they can understand so that it's pertinent to, to what they do? And I, I find that like, when I really build relationships, spend the time to build relationships with my risk partners, that opens up a lot of doors because once they understand that, oh yes, when you can do things like actually control the direction of your supply chain, which you all depend on, that actually helps to reduce risk as well as funnel innovation. And once you put it in those terms, it, it can open a lot of doors with the business side of the house because then they something clicks and they understand, ah, this is the direct impact on me. And it kind of answers the question of what's in it for me. So that's I find that developing those relationships is extremely important, um, even though maybe you know engineers traditionally don't understand that part of the world very well. So it's just helping to open doors and connect people. Talk their language. Yes, that's important. Okay. <laughs> um, so for me, like since I said, I work on all things Kubernetes and CNCF at VMware. Uh, so anything that relates to it kind of has eventually ends up coming to our team, uh, be it any product at VMware that touches Kubernetes essentially. So one of the things that comes as part of my role is to work with product managers and product leadership to mainly look at three things I would say. So one is what are the gaps in our products that can be addressed by open source, uh, be it forward looking things like, okay, maybe this is a feature that we can like make it better through open source or also uh, CVs and vulnerabilities and like escalations, things like that. The second thing is what are, what are our customers really asking? So understanding that and figuring out whether open source can like actually fit the 
like, can address those asks. Uh, and the third thing is also to relay information to product managers around what's latest in the ecosystem be it the new, like, I don't know, there's like working groups coming up, uh, especially in the CNCF context would be like there are a lot of new working groups that are coming up uh, that are around forward looking things like be it AI, like that's a new big thing right now, or uh, what are the future use cases and what are the like the new market segments that we can start looking at. Uh, so that's one side around the product side, but I also want to call out that we I also work pretty closely with engineering leadership. So once we've defined, okay, these are the aspects that we want to contribute to, how do we do it? And uh, like I was saying, uh, it's also about justifying these contributions and how we do it, like how we execute it, uh, and, and talking about the business risks and opportunities versus the engineering hours spent on it in terms of dollars. And like Nitya said, speaking the language. So. There's a lot to it. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> yes, in our company nowadays, you know, the car is like not as a traditional um, like uh, mechanic stuff. It's like telecom products plus four wheels. Uh, it's much more than that, in fact. <clears throat> so how to engage the PMs into the open source part is very important. If you look at the connectivity cars or in our infotainment system, 90% of the code is based on the open source. So many teams using same, same kind of open source platform and how you engage with the PMs to reduce the maintenance time, and et cetera. Also um, for this uh, consumption part, the compliance part, also you need to involve all the PMs because they are the accountability that owns this resp responsibility for each product release. Uh, it's very important also not only before engaging the PM, but also making sure that this open source area is engaged or supported by the up managers, um, like your C-levels managers in your company, which is very important. Uh, it's, it makes you much easier to involve PMs or open source champions later on. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the old days, it used to be the standards bodies, right? Uh, and there would be people who would sit on these standards bodies and have kind of an agenda of what the company needed. And then they would kind of work with the standards body, hopefully to drive it towards that. And then they'd bring back, as Nikita was saying, here are some of the latest things and how we, do we implement it in the product. And I often tell people who are not familiar with open source, that's kind of what we do. We act as a bridge to the open source community and then you know, bring back things uh, back to the uh, team. And I agree with you, you have to speak the language. And then secondly, you've got to show them the implications to the business. There's risk to the business if the project does not continue uh, or the project's license gets hijacked into another license and you can't use it anymore. Uh, there's also investment that comes with open source. Open source is not cheap. It's, what do they say? It's like adopting and getting a free puppy. Uh, that's just the first part, right? You get the free puppy and then you have to maintain the puppy. You have to have people developing, contributing, etc. And that's something that needs to be set aside in the budget so that a certain percentage of your team is set aside to work upstream, to maintain, to support. And justifying that investment needs a, a GM, a product manager to be involved to understand that the cost of ownership of developing this project, uh, developing this product includes, you know, my upstream investment. So you guys all said it so well. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, there are some really strategic and important decisions that get made, you know, in open source. And how do you partner with your business side on things like which projects to engage with, or should we or should we not fork a project? Uh, which project should we consume, contribute to? Uh, especially, you know, with uh, single vendor dominated projects, there are risks that come with that. And so how do you have these discussions? You know, are there forums for these discussions? Nikita, you want to get us started off? Sure. Um, so I think first talking about forking, because I think that's like, the first question that someone asks, like, why don't we just fork this project and do it in house? So, so I think like the first, like one of the core principles of computer science is to reuse. 
right? Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, so that's something we need to keep in mind. And forking gets us into a rabbit hole, but contributing back, it's essentially opens up the world to you. So like, it's all you're free. Basically, you can uh, work with a lot of ideas, build better, innovate faster, and that's something we need to keep in mind. Uh, forking, for instance, like if you're using a project, you fork it. You have a P0 escalation in one of your products that uses this project. It's basically you and only you who's responsible for solving it. But if you have a community around it, if you're using a community-backed project, you can tap into the community's mind share. And then you're having a lot of other people essentially work for you to get the bugs or whatever escalation solved. So I think that's something we need to keep in mind that using community-backed products has value. Uh, so that's one thing about forking. Uh, talking about the strategic involvement, here's how um, we've been thinking around it is like kind of classifying projects, open source projects into four buckets. So one can be around uh, business growing. So maybe like contributing these projects or just getting involved there. Doesn't have to be code contributions necessarily. Helps us open up into new market segments. So something that is more forward looking. Second can be around uh, business enabling. So this is something we ship in our products. So if you're using, I don't, I am more involved in Kubernetes, so I'm just gonna say Kubernetes. So this is something that you should be contributing to. So not contributing is a business risk to your product. Uh, third can be around business uh, empowering. So you contribute so that it relates, it doesn't necessarily, it, it's not shipped into your product directly. It's not a critical part of your software stack. But contributing just also makes you good open source citizens and adds credibility for your company in the industry and makes you good open source citizens. Uh, and fourth is actually business detrimental. So don't like if you contribute to this, this aids your competitors and does not help your business in any way. So kind of thinking along all of these lines helps uh, form a strategy around which open source projects to look into and also make sure that you remain competitive in the market. Very, very cool. John, Mark, what, what, how do you all think about it and how do you work with your business side? This is probably where the contrast is the most stark when it comes to end user enterprise companies versus like a, a vendor. Um, when, I, when I look at like end user enterprises, I would love to say that like a big driver is you know emerging tech and being on top of the innovation that's happening, but let's be honest and say that when it comes to enterprise end user companies, a big driver is pain. <laughs> so when I look at like and if I'm being very frank, over the past five years, there's been an amazing number of developments in this area because five or six years ago, we didn't have all these like criticality scores and other stuff that you know we can now benefit from and actually help us form like a, the basis for risk scoring, for example, or we can look across our, you know, apps that we use and we can actually determine the, the, the health of the um, open source components that we, we all use. Because one thing that is constant among all of our companies is that um, we all rely very heavily on open source software dependencies in our, in our apps. It forms a huge percentage of the, the overall app, you know, infrastructure. Um, but, but now that we have these things it, and, we, and we can feel the pain from like using the bad stuff, it helps push us into a better place where we can actually have the conversations about, you know, maybe we shouldn't be relying on this outdated uh, piece of software that hasn't been maintained in seven years. Maybe that's not such a great idea to base your business on. And so it helps to having these tools lets us, you know, facilitates conversations so we can actually um, move into a more, you know, well-maintained, better positioned, lower risk, things that help us build. Uh, and, and if you look at the, the end result, it's, it's better all around. So you wonder like why people weren't moving down this path already, but it certainly helps to have that um, additional set of data to, to, to back your argument that, you know, we really need to be better about, you know, positioning um, our you know, development processes better and, and being better, um, being more uh, um, efficient and productive in, in how we use the open source software that's available to us. Um, great. I think the tech forking a project as an example is quite common. I mean, each company probably have different strategies towards it. Some companies like you are free to fork and make it publish first, then they do this audit afterwards. And in our case, it's like we are newly started. So we have a, like our Osborne team and open source champion team to support this. 
uh, forking projects, making changes, and uh, doing this upstream to these communities. Um, for some kind of core projects, which is like very big project, like Yokto, for example, we have at least more than three in-house projects, which is highly dependent on it. How to make this more efficient, like each don't each team don't play by themselves. So the alignment of this um, forking and doing this maintenance and upstream is very important. That's such a good point. Um, there could be multiple teams across the company depending upon the same project. So does the OSPO then help coordinate uh, so that you have a consistent kind of interface to that project? Yeah. Um, a number of you, I, I, I think Nikita in particular and I both mentioned that our customers actually ask for open source in our products or to be consistent with an upstream project. I always say uh, customers choose a, a, a successful and, and very competent open source project first. And then they say, can you uh, vendor stand behind this and provide it as a managed service or as a product, an enterprise product? So. We have to uh, consistently, you know, engage with those types of open source projects because it's a, a big business dependency, and uh, our customers expect us to be competent in in that. Um, I'm going to move on to how do you balance the benefits of contributing to open source projects with protecting proprietary interests and maintaining a competitive advantage in the market, especially uh, uh, what are the challenges of communicating the impact and necessity of these contributions to business leaders who may say, why are we contributing this? This is our IP. And have you encountered resistance or gained buy-in? And how have you gained buy-in? All right. Um, so when we, I mean, I've been talking to engineering leadership about this for years. This is a battle that's been fought in various companies. We, like I've worked in startups before, so talk of, dealt with this, this problem before as well. When we go to leadership and say, hey, like, here's why we should focus on this project because it will help us with this feature or it will make this product, our product better in a certain way, that actually doesn't hit the mark. If you talk to them in terms of like what Nitya was saying, business risk, uh, talk about what we lose out upon and how other competitors will, if they jump in and actually start contributing or just get involved in open source, how they are going to do things be better in the market, uh, that hits the mark for them. You have to talk, you have to, like what Nitya said, speak the language uh, of execs, right? Talk in terms of dollars. What's also helped is figuring out um, business continuity uh, arguments around like, hey, we stop contributing this project, what actually happens and actually doing a rundown of everything. Uh, the other thing would also be around f listing down the opportunities you have, the risks you have in terms of the engineering aspect. So like if you say like I have I don't know, five software engineers working on this thing and 20% of their time goes into this, uh, and this does not impact our product, right? So like a lot of arguments these days are made around like, especially it comes from product managers sometimes is, uh, let's not work on open source and work on more critical things that have a direct impact on the product. So figuring, like making that argument of working on open source does not uh, take us away from any critical uh, aspects of the product. I think that's kind of one of the big ones. That's, that's the fear. Uh, yes. that, that you're not serving customers, uh, that you're taking away resources towards the open. Yeah, I think when it comes to the, the, the argument about, well, how do we make money from it if we're giving it for free? And it, this gets back to, I got a name check, one of my old friends, Stephen Wally, who talked about engineering economics and how, you know, the engineering piece is very different from the product piece. And once you're able to build that relationship with your product managers and explain to them, you know, how we form a product is not entirely divorced from, but very separate from how we actually build the code. Code is frankly not worth very much. Um, the final product though, as a whole, with all the pieces that make it uh, the, from the binaries to the support to, to however you, you know, work with the customers, that's valuable. But the source code, eh, I mean, we can all get source code from lots of different places for free. 
Um, the value is in how you actually solve problems for customers. And I think that that's something that you can, that's a conversation you should absolutely have with your product managers. It, I, I find that it um, is very helpful when you frame it that way. Yeah, what about you? Um, great, I think I can talk about this from this aspect. The first one is about uh, build a relationship between uh, legal department and your organization. Uh, since legal is also as acting as a bridge to engineering and this IP and patent team. Uh, it doesn't mean with this good relationship, it will let you go <laughs> sometimes for this contribution uh, if you have any kind of IP leakage at, or etc. But the most important thing is I think define the business value clearly to all of the parties. So the business value always driven things to move. Yep, yep. Uh, I think as, as John Mark was saying, sometimes in an enterprise or a consumer-oriented company like when I was at Comcast, it was easier sometimes to contribute because we're not selling software, we're not selling technology, right? But in technology companies, it becomes harder uh, because this is seen as the moat or the competitive advantage. But um, clearly, you know, we don't need to just focus on code, as you said, John Mark. It is about how do you solve customer problems. And so sometimes we feel, uh, you know, we make it convenient for customers through offering managed services. And that is our secret sauce. Uh, it's the operational excellence, it's the security, it's the safety. It's not the feature function of that particular code, open source code. So it should be uh, pretty good there. Um, one last question before I throw it into the audience uh, to ask questions. You know, it's not just code that one can invest in. Uh, so what are the various investment avenues available for organizations looking to support and contribute to open source and, and frankly sustain open source? It's, it's what we all benefit from. Uh, I think one of the things, uh, we talk most about code, but also there's like a lot of other avenues like documentation, project management, that project, like marketing, uh, events and so on. But I think one other thing I want to call out is a lot of projects uh, need funding to support their infrastructure. Uh, and I think AWS also donated credits for that. So thank you, Nithya. Uh, but uh, I think that's like one area that just people don't think about. Like if that, that is something that they can, you don't have to write code, you don't have to spend engineering hours on it, but if you have the budget for it, I said the B word to John, <laughs> uh, then uh, that's something that you should consider because that's gonna help projects like anything and might not require a lot of investment in terms of time. And I think the other angle, maybe Nathya, you can talk more about it, is around like foundation memberships. Uh, like becoming a member for the Linux Foundation and so on. I think that's also just another way to uh, invest in open source. Thank you for bringing up the whole um, con contributing non-code because so many times in open source spaces we get so wrapped around the axle on code contributions. And again, source code is important, but you look at the most successful communities and they have a healthy contribution of non-code. I think there was like an old um, study done six or seven years ago by Carl Fogel's team with, um, they worked with the World Bank on a uh, uh, project. Anyway, long story short, they did an analysis of like what made that project successful. And what they found out was like, you know, actually only of the funding that went in, less than 60% went to core engineering and over 40% went to non-code marketing, events, documentation, all the things that you don't really think about making up an open source project, those turned out to be extremely important and kind of made the difference between success or less than success. So. Uh, yes, I, I will talk about this from this data-driven transparent aspects. Um, if you would like to funding any kind of open source project in your company, you must find what is the business value, why you do so right, you spend money on all of it. So first, can you find like, let's say top 10 open source project which, which is heavily relied by your company f for the whole organization? It's quite a difficult in fact, if you don't have a good tool to track with this, et cetera, and doing this anal analysis uh, in diligence. 
And second, it's about joining these open source foundations, et cetera. There are so many foundations and open source projects nowadays. Um, but which one you would like to join? Or is there any kind of a duplicated part? Or which one's most important for your ongoing business projects or you're doing some research in the future? So I think doing this diligence work for this business value to define is a very important step to move forward. I think once you have business value there, money, you, you will get uh, the funding easier. <laughs> yep, again, the translation, the express it in business uh, terms and show value. Um, I, I sometimes find that it's easier to justify funding versus headcount to do uh, contributions. So uh, it's easier to sometimes give money versus, or money for, say, a foundation to hire someone to do that work. Uh, for instance, we fund a couple of foundations to hire security engineers so that they can um, actually do important work of CV CVs and you know um, handling that, uh, and it really helps. And, and to your point, you can also volunteer from a governance perspective. You sit on the TSC, uh, I sit on uh, the LF board, so we can really lend our business hats and and support and you know uh, other ways to contribute to the uh, foundation to to this uh, important initiative of sustaining. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the audience and see if there were any questions from the audience. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Hey, so uh, is, it's working, yes? yes. Okay, um, so I, I work with a couple of PMs, not as many as I like, we can't ever like get them, but uh, <laughs> we tend to, uh, we tend to, thank you, to, uh, so when, when I talk to my PMs about working on open source, they tend to just hear risk, risk, risk. They hear this is going to take so much longer if we write it externally, we get it externally reviewed than if we were to just implement it internally. Uh, or, you know, what if they don't like the way that we want to implement this feature? What if they don't want to implement it at all? How do you usually weigh, like, the, the, the flip side to those things, right, is that it's taking longer because it's going to be, you know, it's, it's, more, it's better reviewed, it's going to have fewer bugs. How do you usually weigh these kinds of things to your PMs to not, like, make them run screaming away from open source? I have scars. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, can, I can't count the number of times I've had that conversation. Usually the, the retort that doesn't work but makes me feel better about myself is, well, if you'd been involved from the beginning, it wouldn't be taking longer. But, you know, that's not so useful of a discussion point, you know, after the fact. And, I, I mean, I, the only way I know to frame it is that, you know, it's, it's not about immediate returns. It's about, like, when you play the long game. Again, the, the point that I made, uh, I think in the, in the the first question was if you can actually play a role in maintaining the supply chain that you're depending on, like you're depending on this stuff, then like why wouldn't you make the investment in that direction? And yeah, okay, it's not going to be an immediate return, but again, you should be thinking longer term as a product person anyway. But okay, let me put that in for neither terms. <laughs> Work with me, and I can help. I can help you help me uh, when we can get further together. Is kind of the way I would phrase that. But there's there's a continuing it it the return on investment compounds over time, and it's not just a one time thing. I think that's the main thing to hit on. Is like it's not just this one particular thing. It's look at the totality of investment, look at the totality of returns that we're going to get, and how they compound on a regular basis, and that's the sort of like discussion you need to have. Um, I think this is a very interesting story, and uh, it happens in our company too. But our approach is like um, making the app managers speak about it, because the PMs, product managers, have different kind of uh, competence scope, and they comes and goes and leaves. It's very difficult for employee to continuously to discuss this with their own PM. But if you have a signal from your, let's say, head of R&D, talk about this, we embrace open source, we do this upstream work, et cetera. So it's a culture built in your company. So it's much easier for each employee to discuss this to their PMs for this contribution. Uh, I just want to add one thing. So uh, the, we 
we've done two things. So one is like if like have the product managers actually get involved in open source themselves. Uh, so we like have them get involved early. So uh, for instance, if you have if product, if you have opinions, like as a company, if you have opinions on a particular idea or feature or something, and if you notice that they have discussions, the discussion starting on this topic, get involved at that point. Don't wait. Uh, because if you want a seat at the table, you just need to show up first, right? So I think conveying that to product managers has helped to an extent that if you have opinions, show up and talk about those opinions. Oh gosh, I hope we didn't stop your answer. I was oh, just oh, signals. Okay, so um, I, I think that a lot of times you're, you're going to have. Uh, the decision makers that you're trying to convince, the, the PMs or, or any other kind of decision maker, uh, where they're looking for something concrete. Now, granted, you might be graced by, you know, approaching one that's already like, hey, I love open source. I'm totally a champion already, and that's wonderful. You don't have to do anything. You know, but there are probably lots of people that are like, well, it's about the money. And that's something that we've talked about over and over again. It's like, you have to convince them or hope that they're going to be visited by three ghosts, you know, and so are there any kind of like business scenarios or cases that you point people to to say, look, here is already something that this other company has published to say, this is how we got our ROI off of open source. Because right now we're talking about concepts, right? And you can try to convince them, but sometimes people need something more concrete, some other historical thing that's happened. You know, are there any things that you could point us to? I... I I don't know if on the to-do group page, todogroup.org, there could be some case studies of companies that have done uh, ROI or metrics. I'm also looking at Don Foster from a chaos perspective. I don't know if they have done uh, numbers around you know, the return on investment of, of working with an upstream project as opposed to building it yourself. Um, I know it, it also, we can do back of the envelope calculations inside companies ourselves. We often don't. We kind of say, oh, I, uh, it has to be exact or else I won't do it. But even back of the, uh, like, like the studies that the Linux Foundation has been publishing, really say uh, hourly you know, developers are paid so much and uh, so many lines of code are written, and so the value of Linux is equal to this, or Kubernetes is equal to this. So I think we can do some more back of the envelope kind of discussions um, around it. Yes, go ahead. Just one uh, point to add to that. The World Bank study from 2017, that actually made the calculation of a two to one investment, um, return to investment ratio. Uh, I can send the link around later if, if y'all are interested. How do you respond, how do you respond or what are some of the answers around uh, if others in the company are asserting that through through your company's contributions you are enabling uh, competitors to catch up to you I I've heard that yeah. uh, all of us have heard that yeah. right how, how do you tackle that I think you said it's not about code man no, it's about, about solving problems much. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I did say that. <laughs> but I, I can remember many, back in the old days when I worked at uh, enterprise startups with open source products, I remember fondly the conversations I had with sales about our open source product is our number one competitor. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that is not correct. Uh, but but it, it's it's a very real fear. And I don't, honestly, I've never figured out the right way to get that across to the folks that that sell software that know really seriously if we're delivering value it, it's really not an issue and I, I i'd actually be interested in what the rest of the panel has to say about that because i i was never successful <laughs> in in uh making that argument but what i would say is that you know again it's about value deliver and at the end of the day like amazon's a great example i could get all the source code from amazon all day long and i could not recreate their success with their products because it's not about the code. Well, it is the code, but it's a lot more than that. Right. So. And it's solving problems, and it's to your point.
point, there's the go-to-market aspect of it, the customer service aspect of it, the packaging of it. It's so much more than code. So it cannot be just about code competition. And, and frankly, you also leverage other people's code. And, uh, and so it, it all comes back to us. Sorry, I, I think there was one question here. And then I'll go to you. And I'll come to you if we have time. Hi. Um, so I am curious to know um, from all of you, you know, how, because we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, convincing product people that open source is worth investing time in. And one of the things that I see is that people who do a lot of work in open source at their companies, they're in that external community a lot. And then people within the company don't really know what they're doing or unless it's like, a really easy win, a feature that needs to be done, and then it, you know, but then there's always like this roadmap, and you have to do a lot of things for the community that don't have a direct impact on product or, you know. And so, how do you handle the recognition within your company of that work? And so that that actually translates to your career long term at, within that company and not just in your open source community. This is a very Such good. Such a great question. This is a very good question. I was thinking this yesterday also. Uh, as you know, yesterday we just announced that Volvo Cars have adopted the Open Chain ISO standard program. So how we communicated this both internally and externally? Maybe externally is easier by by sending the LinkedIn message, for example. So internally, like you have many like communication channels. Uh, for example, we have this uh, Slack channel and uh, Teams channel, which, which is different groups, like management level and the engineers level. And also PM Corp, this communication of practice for PM. So all PMs in the whole organization is in that group, sending this information to all of the PO so they will know it. And also for open source communication, uh, collaboration with open source projects with the communities, Usually, only these people who is main participating in the community they know what happened, but many people in the organization don't know what happened. So, being a membership or whatever join this community is on behalf of uh, the whole company, not a team. So, you need to spread this, inf this information in the whole organization, not only in your local teams. It's a challenge, but it's you must need to have several. Uh, channels to spread it, including your communication department in your company as well, for the newsletter globally, et cetera. I'll say a couple of things and then I'll turn it over to Nikita. Uh, one is developer advocates and uh, community members should really be communicating what they're hearing on the ground and add value and send it in to product managers as inbound communications from customers, from community, et cetera. So show that you are one of the streams that they should depend upon for um, you know, creating their requirements, right? The second, we, we are trying also at Amazon to work with HR to make sure that the open source contributions are reflected in promotion documents, in um, you know, uh, compensation and review, uh, because often job requirements inside companies do not show open source as a, a key component of their uh, competencies. Yeah, just to talk more about the promotion angle, what we've also done in the past is uh, for, uh, like if someone has a, rec a review or a endorsement for promotion, we also take uh, that into consideration for from people who we worked in open source, so not in the same company itself. So that's one thing. I w the other thing that we've, our team has faced is like sometimes we used to get pinged on Slack with a random team who's working on our open source project and they ask us a question. We'd answer that and just get lost. So the impact that we've helped this team would just not get communicated anywhere. So one thing that we decided is like we're going to create a Jira ticket or whatever issue tracker system that you use whenever we do that. So all of our contributions, all of this thankless work that we do, we started tracking it all and that helped. The other thing is also nice. educating our managers about this and getting this added to OKRs that like maintenance of this project is also crucial. And this is something that is our goal. So like we, we just added to our objectives. 
uh, and also lastly I think one uh, quick last thing I'd say is like it's not just about the features and bugs that we solve but also influence so I think calling that metric out is also important that hey we just participated in this discussion but that eventually helped in influencing this feature so I think calling that out was pretty helpful very very good good guidance we are out of time uh, I'm so sorry we are not able to take any additional questions but um, hopefully we can keep this discussion going online yeah maybe on Twitter I'll, I'll post something and and see if anyone wants to ask additional questions and thank you all so much for your time thank you all for your uh, time an important topic we should continue this <laughs>